sermon for the third Sunday after the Epiphany. This morning we are reading from Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Now after John was imprisoned, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. He said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. As he went along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in their boat, mending nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. With all of its sparse economy of words, Mark's Gospel may leave us with at least as many questions as it answers. For example, did the men who were to become the first disciples actually know anything about Jesus before they simply dropped everything and followed him? Had they been aware of John the Baptist's preaching? Were they among those who went down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John? And, of course, if we dare break away from biblical literalism and inerrancy, we might ask, is Mark's account truly how it happened? Or is it perhaps a community construct, so to speak? It is, after all, so very different from the account at the onset of John's Gospel, and differs at least somewhat from the accounts in Luke and Matthew. We could, of course, spend a lot of time debating the authenticity of the Gospel accounts, and perhaps in its own way that might be a worthy endeavor. But ultimately, I would want us to be reminded that the Gospels are the good news about Jesus. Their narrative details exist primarily to shed light on the one whom we profess a desire to follow. And it is that concept of following that I would like to briefly address this morning. Jesus, it seems, according to Mark, has taken up the mantle of John the Baptist. John has been arrested, and it now falls, it seems, to Jesus to proclaim, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is near. Repent, believe the gospel. Once again, Mark's details are either sparse or perhaps non-existent. We know, of course, approximately where Jesus is operating. We know something of the sequence of events. For example, prior to this morning's text, Jesus was baptized and then driven out into the wilderness to be tempted. We know that John was arrested, and now it is Jesus who is calling people to repentance. He is also, by the way, announcing the imminent time of God's kingdom and is calling people to believe the gospel. Now, now, frankly, at least from Mark's narrative, we really can't necessarily learn a whole lot about what any of that even means. At least, not until we get to Jesus' encounter with a group of fishermen, Simon and Andrew, James and John. The authors of Mark's Gospel would have us believe, or so it appears, that these four men abandoned what they were doing simply on the strength of a single command, come, and follow me, or in the case of the first two, a command with a promise, follow me, and I will enable you to fish for people, make you fishers of men, as it were. It may very well have been exactly that way. The use of the word immediately in verse 18 and 20 strengthen the position that Mark wants us to view this as a sudden, life-altering decision, or perhaps something beyond decision, almost a compulsion on the part of these new disciples. Would that all of our decisions in life and in our work be made with such alacrity, 
let alone such life-altering decisions. Now, Calvinists and some others here might balk at my use of the term decision. I'll leave that, I think, for others to bandy about. I'm pretty certain that from the grassroots perspective, or more appropriately, the sea level perspective, to anyone watching this little scene unfold, it certainly would have seemed like a decision, and a sudden, perhaps illogical one at that. Surely Mr. Zebedee might have been complaining, what kind of crazy decision are you making here, boys? The operative part, however, is that these men, all four of them, did follow. And perhaps their following might become something either of a pattern for us or else to shed some light on our own following of Jesus. Here are just a few thoughts regarding that call, that hearing of Christ's voice. Not everyone will hear or otherwise heed the call the same way or at the same time. We're not told if anyone was in the boat with Simon and Andrew. However, James and John were accompanied by their father and some hired hands. When Jesus called them from the shore, it is James and John alone who suddenly stop what they are doing. Was it clear that Jesus was speaking only to them? If he addressed them by name, the text certainly doesn't say so. Perhaps it was clear to them that the Lord was speaking only to them. Or perhaps they were the ones who were ready, while the others, Dad and the hired men, were not. In a way, it doesn't matter. The principle here is that the call at that particular juncture was not necessarily for everyone. That's tough for us to take, particularly if we're coming out of an American Protestant evangelical background. We tend to associate heeding the call with salvation and imagine that those who don't heed the call or somehow miss it are forever doomed. And yet the gospel proclaims no such thing, certainly not in this passage. All we can surmise with any certainty is that the call was received by those who were able to receive it. So they followed. And the next principle we might derive from this little scriptural vignette is that following Jesus entails a redefining of one's identity. Now that's not often terribly comfortable. We do, after all, like to think that we are pretty good the way we are. We want to believe that we are good people, industrious people, moral people. Well, shouldn't that be enough? And naturally, those are indeed excellent qualities to be good and industrious and moral. But interestingly enough, following Jesus is not really about being a good person, per se. Chances are, Zebedee was a good person by the standards of his day. More than likely, the hired men were probably good as well. But following Jesus... You see, when Simon and Andrew, James and John followed Jesus, they possibly inadvertently and unwittingly redefine themselves. Hitherto, they had obviously been defined as fishermen, possibly also as fathers and husbands and sons. In short, they were defined by the nomenclature that the world gives them, and they act accordingly. They were governed by the world's rivalries, by its oppressive powers, by its perceived scarcities, and most of all, by the thing that delineates all human thought and endeavor. They were governed by death itself. All human activities, if we think about it, are hemmed in, defined, or otherwise motivated by the thought that we will, even if we are granted longevity, nonetheless 
all too soon die. But when they found themselves following Jesus, they had taken a step towards new definition. Not only were they no longer living merely for the daily catch and the market price of fish, not only had they gone from what in their day would have been considered a pretty stable occupation to one of questionable worth, essentially that of mendicant street preacher, they had in fact taken a step towards being identified with Jesus, a step towards imitating Jesus, as opposed to being found in imitation of the world, a world where everything is a transaction and human relationships are forever marred by conflict and self-interest. They most likely didn't know it yet, those disciples, but to follow, to literally follow in someone's footsteps, is in fact to imitate them. Simply in virtue of our being human, we all imitate someone or something. Undoubtedly, the disciples, before being called by Jesus, imitated what? Their father, surely. Their peers do like the other fishermen. The culture around them. Much as we imitate our forebearers and our peers and the prevailing culture, we talk like them or sometimes in opposition to them. We act like them or maybe against them. But either way, our very persona our very nature is an imitation of the world into which we were born. To follow Jesus, as the disciples would soon learn, is to put aside the old identity. No fuller repentance could there be. Put aside the old identity and follow after, imitate the ways and the life of Jesus. And that would bring us to the final point. Just before Jesus called the four fishermen, he was preaching. Preaching that the kingdom of God is drawing near. And that would be the last principle, at least for now, that we may glean from this text. To follow Christ, to imitate Jesus, is to take a step into the kingdom. Uh, to follow Jesus, and that will be a way that leads to the cross, and beyond the cross, to life no longer bounded by death, the fear of death. To imitate Jesus is to be a part of the construction of the kingdom within oneself, and ultimately within our world. To be a part of the process of transformation, to usher in those days, the old ways are passing away like so much mist. For in the kingdom, there is no place for the mindset that loves things and uses people. There is no place for the mindset of every man and woman for him or herself. There is no place for hatred, nor prejudice. No place for the inherent mentality of us and them. May we, even as we hear the voice of Jesus calling, step out of the comfort zone of whatever constitutes the familiar safety of our figurative personal fishing boats. May we find a new, far larger, far greater identity as those who are all about imitating Christ. Mm -hmm.